The following recording is a program of the World War I Historical Association. This special ongoing series commemorates the centennial of the First World War. This is Dana Lombardi. On September 20th, 2014, the Florida and Gulf Coast chapter of the World War I Historical Association held a seminar with the co-sponsorship of the Public Library of Foley, Alabama. Six noted scholars gave presentations under the theme 1914 Europe Goes to War. These presentations are presented here in six videos recorded at the event. Before I start with the speakers, I'd like to introduce two of our officers who are, who are here. Uh, Steve Sutterby, our secretary and former president, who's going to be taking over for me this afternoon. And Connie Tibbetts, who's a member of our executive committee and an inveterate attendee in, in all our programs, including our many trips overseas to the battlefronts. The, we have several people to thank for this, uh, this seminar. First off, of course, uh, John Jackson is the director of the library, who's picking up all the expenses. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Because of that, we do have to charge our usual full small fee to attend the seminar. I also want to thank all of our speakers who came here uncompensated at their own expense to talk to you. And we have a marvelous line of speakers. We certainly appreciate their patronage. We couldn't operate what WW1FA, the World One Historical Association, without them. The first speaker this morning is Andrew Weist of the University of Southern Mississippi, who is going to talk about the BDF and the outbreak of the war and the Battle of Pachadale and a whole bunch of other stuff. I made one mistake on his bio, which is at the back of the, back of the program. His prize, uh, besides the book, here's the distinguished book prize, was won by him for a book called The Forgotten Army. It's about Vietnam, about the North Vietnamese, the Vietnamese Army. And something I know nothing about. The book I remember of Andy's that uh, I always liked was the one on uh, the Royal Navy in Passchendaele. You're going to talk to me about that today, I think, too. So, anyway, please step forward and uh, say your piece. Welcome. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to this opportunity. I'm a, have recently uh, transformed, not recently, I guess that's recently in dog years, transformed myself into a Vietnam era historian and I'm happy to get back to my World War I roots. It's been a while since, uh, uh, since I uh, got to deal with these topics and when Lane called me, probably emailed me in the modern world about giving a paper at the conference, I was really excited to accept it. Kind of the one I went to was at um, Leavenworth when I That's came right. up to speak before, uh, especially with this being the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of the war. Um, I began to mull around in my head what I'd like to talk about, and of course the outbreak of the war itself seemed like a, a pretty good place to go, but then it dawned on me I really didn't have anything new to stay here to a group like this who is so up on World War I. Um, it'd all be old hash, old stuff that you'd heard before. My next idea, of course, was to work on Britain and the war since that my, was my major research area for a zillion years. And what better to cover when uh, dealing with Britain and the war than some kind of controversial argument about Douglas Haig. That's what everybody uh, likes to talk about. Was he an idiot or was he uh, pretty good. That's one way to fire up a World War I crowd, but I suspect uh, this crowd has been fired up by that argument a couple times before and perhaps has the scars to show for it. Um, so after I ruled out those avenues, um, I came down to the avenue of uh, 
uh, looking at uh, British strategy on the Western Front in, uh, as the war was getting cranked up, um, uh, specifically after the troops hit the ground and, uh, and the war uh, really, got, really got started. Debates, strategic debates that were long at the center of my research agenda, long at the center of a book that my mom and 10 other people read, um, but got me promoted, <coughs> so that's fine. Um, and actually began the, the long road to the Battle of Passchendaele, uh, which I had the good luck to go take a bunch of students to see this summer. Not the battle itself, that would have been really neat, that would have required a time travel device. Uh, we went to the battlefield, uh, which I was surprised, even after a hundred years, I thought the uh, tourism might be up a little bit for World War I battlefield, but we were all too often alone, except for big places like Tyne Cot and things like that. Um, the initial strategy of the BDF is a is a certainly a well-known thing, cooked up in secret pre-war talks with the French, as everybody I'm presuming knows. The BDF was to arrive in France and uh, join the left flank of the French forces near Mons and be relegated essentially to flank guard duty to watch Plan 17 unfold and whip the Germans. Uh, the Brits could have tea and crumpets and applaud the French victory. Of course, that didn't work out too well, and they wound up facing the front of the of the German advance, and then wound up with the front row seat at the Battle of the Marne. So it was a little bit of a different strategy unfolding than either side either side expected. Um, of course, what happened then was the counterattack at the I never get this word right. Somebody help me. Ain A I S M E. Somebody help me with that. Pardon? I got it right. I never. I, I, I presume for years I was pronouncing that word incorrectly. Of course, that battle also wound up without a clear-cut decision, and suddenly French-British-German strategy was all at loose ends. Uh, the war had supposed to have already been decided by this point, or at least on its way to a decision. Somebody was about to be surrendering at this point, but that wasn't happening. And the Allied and German forces bogged down in France and Belgium and really didn't have clear goals in mind at this point. And strategically, the way I like to put it, the war veered off of a symphonic score and embarked on some jazz improvisation. These guys began to think uh, on their feet, something not usually attributed to where one general was thinking at all, much less thinking on your feet. Uh, as British strategy is concerned, I find this to be one of the most intriguing periods of the war because this is when everything was open. Uh, they, they, they could have done lots of things at this point. Nothing was set in stone. The Western Front, as we know it, it had yet to start. It was getting set, but it wasn't, wasn't set yet. So what we get is a very important period of military and governmental debate, one that harkened back to what Britain has strategically been for centuries, and one that actually took off on some wild flights of fancy that you wouldn't expect in World War I, um, but also set Britain on a direct collision course with what happened in 1917, uh, the Third Battle of Heat, or the Battle of Passchendaele. Uh, this jazz improvisation period, the first part of it is generally called the race to the sea, which we know wasn't a race at all. It was attempts by both sides to outflank each other and restore some kind of war of movement that favored them in some meaningful way. Um, during this time, British political leaders uh, and military leaders harken back to perhaps their most important uh, bit of national strategy, never allow a hostile power to dominate the other side of the English Channel. That just simply can't happen. Indeed, the threat implied by German seizure of the Channel ports, especially those of Belgium, most notably Antwerp, Boston, and Zeebrugge, uh, really weighed heavily, at, at, even at the beginning, with General Sir John French, the Commander-in-Chief of the BEF. He later wrote about what he was doing in September, so this is really early. Quote, my fear for the Channel ports which began to lay a stronghold about my thoughts and all probability influenced my mind and perhaps affected my dispositions throughout the rest of the time during which I took my part in the Battle of the Ain. So already he's fixated on this, at least to a certain degree. At the same time that French fretted about the relationship with the ongoing fighting and the Belgian coast, uh, another really powerful uh, personality enters the fray. This is, of course, Winston Churchill, uh, First Lord of the Admiralty. He pays his first visit to the front lines 
And the reason he's there to talk to French at all is to impress upon him the uh, importance of making sure the Germans do not take those ports. And if they do take them, uh, they must be uh, seized, re retaken immediately. They had a very extended conversation. This is the beginning of September 1914, so this is, again, early stuff. Um, they both agreed that if the Allied attacks around Eve, that's what they're both planning on, that's at least what uh, the British and French are planning on at this time, that if those attacks failed, uh, which they ultimately are going to do, then the next thing they have to do is guard those ports. Uh, Churchill left that meeting and went home and prepared the Navy for its role to play in an amphibious assault along the coast, uh, something that I got a chance to write about uh, many years ago, didn't I, Lynn? And now it came back up magically after a long time. Churchill, of course, was disappointed. The French was disappointed. Along with forces under the French, under the command of General Joseph Joffre, uh, the BEF uh, initially focused its um, efforts um, around the uh, town of Yeep. And what happens on October 10th, Antwerp is lost. Um, even with that happening, the British retain an, an intense focus on the Flanders area, not on the coastal area. Flanders is just a little further south. Um, leaving the coast to the, to the Belgians to defend, which is perhaps not uh, the route to victory in that area. Um, as the BEF continued to get ready for its first Yeep hasn't started yet, uh, the Belgians then start retreating down the coast. The First Lord uh, got in touch with the cabinet and said, this is, uh, uh, this is not going to fly. Uh, we have to do something with those ports. We at least have to disable them, if nothing else. Uh, Colonel Maurice Hankey, if you're familiar with the way the cabinet functions, he's their cabinet secretary, and his papers are perhaps the most revealing about what's going on. In the cabinet, Maurice Hankey remembers the cabinet suggesting that these ports be destroyed. So even if the Germans did take them, if the Belgians collapsed in their defense, that there'd be nothing for the Germans to operate uh, from. Uh, Churchill began to prepare the Navy to do that. But then word came in from French that, golly, this, this Eve offensive is going to be great. It's going to it's going to win this wonderful victory that we need. And then we are going to need Austin, Seabrugge, and Antwerp as forward ports for our logistic structure for our rush into Germany. So the, the BEF tells the Navy, do not destroy those ports. And of course, what happens, the Belgians evacuate those ports on October 12th. And on October 15th, the Germans seize two fully operational ports. This is not something that the Navy is going to look happily at. And all Hanke later commented on this, quote, Later in the war, those two ports became a very, this is Ostend and Zeebrugge, became a very serious menace to our communications and necessitated the retention of large naval forces in the Strait of Dover. And they'd much rather not have forces in the English Channel. They'd rather have those off dealing with the Germans uh, um, in a capital sense. Uh, also, the campaign in Flanders, 1917, with its appalling losses, would probably never have been sanctioned. And that's true. The, the, I mean, as we're going to, as well, I'm not going to talk about here, uh, but it's the, the debate over Pachendaele is very evenly divided, and the Navy casts a pretty important vote in that. Um, the campaign in Flanders, with its appalling losses, would probably never have been sanctioned, but for the anxiety with which the German submarines and destroyers at Zeebrugge were causing the Admiralty. So we're for, forecasting into the future. But we're also forecasting back into the past. This is what Britain has always cared about. Uh, who owns the other side of that channel? Of course, what did happen, uh, uh, First Eep, is a, is a failure. In fact, it's you know, actually almost a close-run thing the other way. Um, now the English Channel does stand in jeopardy. And Churchill is going to enter the fray even more deeply. Churchill writes to Sir John French uh, um, at the, uh, in mid-October, quote, but my dear friend, I will trust that you will realize how damnable it would be, Churchill even cusses, it's amazing, how damnable it would be if the enemy settles down for the winter, not five years, just for the winter, along lines that composed Calais, they were still worried about the Germans advancing further, Dunkirk or Ostend. There will be continual alarms and greatly added difficulties. We must have him off the Belgian coast, even if we cannot recover Antwerp. If you could gain passage off to the left, I would give you overwhelming support from the sea 
and there you would have a flank that they cannot turn. So here we also see Churchill uh, <coughs> dangling a nice bait in front of Ranch. Uh, everybody's hunting for that turnable flank, and he's saying the Navy can, can, can finally give it to you. Um, Churchill had realized that it's going to take more than naval reasons for the Army to go up there and focus itself on the coast. The French wants a crushing victory, that's what everybody wants, and of course French is looking for a victory in which a very small BEF can play an outsized role. And that's why Churchill is dangling this carrot in front of him, that by working with the overpowering force of the Navy, we can turn the Germans off the coast and do something strategic. So Churchill's got a pretty smart couple of tacks he's taking with French here. In a letter on November 22nd, Churchill continued this verbal assault on Sir Don French. In this letter, it's clear that he's trying to paint a picture of this unmatched power of the Navy and how it can help the BEF and attract this BEF attention to the coast. He says, quote, if you choose to push your left flank along the sea dunes of the shore of Ostend to Zeebrugge, I can give you 100 or 200 heavy guns and absolutely devastating support. Kind of quaint how 100 or 200 heavy guns is devastating at this point in the war. It's gonna, those numbers are going to change dramatically later on in the war. For four or five miles inshore, this would make you perfectly safe and superior. Here at last, you have their flank, if you care to use it. And surely the coast strip, held and fed well with troops, would clear the whole line out almost to Dixmude and hand it right back, if not clear it altogether. If the attack were quick and sudden, their big guns would be caught too. We could bring men in at Ostend to Zeebrugge to reinforce you, so naval landing and amphibious landing the British love to think of outsized ways to use their navy and make a southeastern push. There's no limit to what can be done by an extreme left-handed push and the sea operation all the way up to the Dutch frontier. So he's playing exactly the fiddle that that, that French uh, wants to hear. And golly, can French resist this offer? And the answer is no, he, he doesn't resist this offer at all. He wants to see the British play this crucial role. He, he'd rather be the first fiddle to Joff's second fiddle if he could. But, of course, there is the problem of winning the French. That's always a confusing part of this. And Joff commands the French and French commands the British. But my students always have a hard time with that in World War I class. Uh, but, but hopefully we're conversant enough with those names here uh, to not get too lost. <coughs> French is pretty, cons pretty convinced that Flanders and the areas north are the area in which Britain can make its great push, um, even with a few men, but he has to convince Joff of this. Second important aspect of this letter from Churchill, again, it shows the genesis of an amphibious landing. Um, uh, can't get into it too far here, but it's always part of the plan. It, it's part of the plan from 1914 on through through 1917, and even into 1918, when a lot of folks think Passchendaele planning is long since, uh, long since over. French couldn't commit, even though he was smitten by Churchill's ideas. He had bigger fish to fry. He had to rebuild the BEF from its substantial, substantial losses. And he also had to win over the French to any planning that he had, as I mentioned before. As France considered his options about how best to work this long-term notion, the Royal Navy didn't sit idly. It began its own planning. The Admiralty looked into two ideas about solving the riddle of the Belgian coast on its own, because that's often, you know, what's thrown back in their face. You're going to rely on the military to do something about the coast. Why can't, why can't you? However, shelling the ports, the Admiralty studied that and then came back and said, all we're going to do is damage the ports. The Germans are going to be able to fix them. And subjecting warships to land-based fire is a pretty big risk. And if the ship goes down, you don't just pull it up and fix it. So it would be too, too big a risk. How about a blocking operation, which eventually is going to, of course, take place in 1918, where you sink ships and, and block the ports as well. Again, this was suggested by the Admiralty. They did extensive planning on it. But this time it was the War Cabinet, not the War Cabinet at this point, but the Cabinet that says this is impractical, don't do it. So the Admiralty looks into two ways to affect this strategy itself, and both of them are turned down, leaving only this kind of military operation along the coast as the last man standing. While focusing on the coast, let's say that the fertile minds of people like Churchill uh, were not done with how they thought they could use naval power. 
And again, some of these ideas are coming up with are so wild that people poo-pooed the one idea that would have worked. Bam! That's interesting. Uh, people poo-pooed the one idea that perhaps would have worked and that was taken seriously, the Belgian coast. At one point, Churchill and Sir John Fisher, uh, the professional head of the uh, Navy at this time, uh, one of their proposals was to seize an island off the German coast. Borkum is what they were hoping for. Uh, thinking that they, if they stick 20,000 men on that island, it would block German egress to the North Sea. Of course, there's a dumb idea that really wouldn't work at all. Um, uh, another idea was, and this one, Fisher loved this one. Uh, uh, Fisher came up with some really crazy stuff. Uh, his idea was to launch an invasion of Germany using an amphibious invasion of Germany using the British Navy and Russian Cossacks landing in eastern Germany. There'd be a surprise. Um, the cabinet, I think they were a little bit, if you look at the cabinet debates, they're, they're kind of happy with the idea of landing a bunch of Cossacks in, in Germany. And, and A, the Navy's played a big role. B, British people don't die. It's Russians that die. Um, but wiser heads prevailed. And both of those ideas were turned down. So again, the Belgian coast that it usually gets lumped in with those as well. Wasn't that just a flight of fancy? The big one that they also began to look at, which is of extreme importance, they began to look at a naval operation against the newest of the Central Powers, Turkey. Uh, they began to look at the Dardanelles operation uh, at, this, at this early stage. Uh, the, uh, the Admiralty was concerned that if you took the Dardanelles, you could reopen the trade route to Russia, perhaps force the weak Turks to capitulate, and perhaps again having too much of a vision of what naval power can do, and that's perhaps that's a sub theme here. Naval power can do anything if you're Churchill and, and, and Fisher. At this point in time, the Admiralty planners think that it's going to cost too much. Uh, there's not enough ships to do it. Your ships need to be concentrated against the German high seas fleet in the North Sea, wasting them in the Dardanelles. Um, wouldn't work, and also you'd probably need a bunch of troops in Gallipoli to make this work. And you barely have enough troops to populate the Western Front at this point. So the troops weren't available. Uh, it would have been a waste of shipping. So the Dardanelles is ruled out. Forcing Churchill and Fisher back to the Belgian coast, that's the last man, last man standing. But as we know, the Dardanelles is going <coughs> is to pop up again. The jettisoning of all this other planning did the trick. Churchill now totally focuses, and Fisher totally focuses, on winning French and Joffre over to this attack along the Belgian coast. Um, they'd also won over the government by 1914. The War Cabinet agrees to this thing. The War Cabinet agrees, excuse me again, the Cabinet, War Cabinet hadn't been formed, the Cabinet agrees to, uh, to, to, to back this. Lord Kitchener himself becomes the lead proponent of this thing in the Cabinet. Um, a man with a, a checkered history in this war, but, but his influence at this point is great, especially when combined with that of French and now Churchill and Sir John Fisher. This, this thing's getting a lot, a lot of attention. The fly in the ointment, though, were the French, was Joff. He still is the chief partner in this whole thing. What he says goes. And he doesn't want an attack in northern Belgium. He wants an attack in France. That's where this war is going to be decided is in France. So we, we reach a planning standoff. The British have been won over to their strategic goal of a century, re retake the coast. Uh, the French are being recalcitrant, which they always are about British uh, ideas to, to, to move along the coast. And what you get is actually a, the first real big crisis in Allied planning. Uh, Sir Edward Grey uh, sends a telegram, he's a British foreign minister, so this is a very official telegram, not signed by Asquith, so it doesn't go up that high but this is like the next, next level of importance. He sent a telegram to the French government, quote, His Majesty's government believes that British troops should be so placed in the line as to advance along the coast in immediate cooperation with our fleet and thus enable us, if necessary, to land further forces at any critical juncture during the operation. I would point out to the French government that the people of this country realize that the Belgian coastal possessions now held by the Germans are a menace to Great Britain. They would therefore regard any losses entailed by an active offense taken by our troops against these coastal positions as fully justified. British public opinion will even demand that that menace be removed. So it's the British government telling the French government this is what we want to do. So this thing has risen to a, a place of allied controversy. Uh, the government sends this matter immediately to Joffre. Joffre, who again in my class looks a little bit like 
Captain Kangaroo uh, laughs at it. And, and, and well, what he says is, no, we're not going to do this, because again, he is the senior guy. He says there is going to be a winter campaign in Artois. Well, we'll forget it. We're not going to. We're not going to go along the coast, no matter what you Brits, no matter how much you want to rattle your sabers. The French is going to do what he's told. Again, there's still high optimism that this attack will rout the Germans. Uh, Churchill, though, uh, is another matter, as you might suspect, since this thing is his, is his uh, brainchild. Uh, he says that, quote, the Navy will do its best in the, quote, feeble secondary dog in the manger attack, unquote, that the French are planning. So he's really not happy. Um, in fact, he's probably going off to have a few drinks. Um, but expecting that the plan would fall short, Churchill redoubles his efforts to make sure that French remains focused on this coastal thing. He continues and continues and continues to hammer French. What he's hoping is that when the French offensive fails, uh, the British will finally, finally get their chance. And a note of final gloom in his continued pressure on French, Churchill tells French in a letter, quote, unless there's some genuine push made on the left flank, we cannot hang about day after day amid these perils. Again, this is early 1915, late 1914 that we're talking about here. Imagine in 1917 when it's different Admiral blowing this same horn. Uh, uh, how much more pressure they're able to put on the government. At the failure of Joss Winter Offensive, because again, that's what happens in World War I offensives, right? They tend to fail with high cost. At the failure of Joss Winter Offensive to achieve anything like de decisive results, both allies return to their planning, and this time the British have the upper hand. This time the British are going to get what they want. Churchill meets this thing with glee. You can almost see it in the letters he's sending out from the from the Admiralty, he's almost tittering with enjoyment the fact that the French have failed, and now that it's his turn, and he has a new twist, the possibility of Austin and Seabrugge being held, meaning that the BEF will be cut off in France. And he's, he's, he's playing one more card, and one more card. He says, quote, it must be recognized that the whole transportation of troops across the channel will be seriously and increasingly compromised by German occupation of the Belgian coast. So again, he's just hammering French just that, just that little further. Just that little further. Churchill also wrote to French to make it clear, again, what the Navy could do. He wrote, quote, in Zeebrugge, I feel sure we could assault it at the critical moment. And as the theory of your attack can be assailed from the sea, and then we kick back towards Ostend. Again, a naval landing. And he's pounding this and pounding this. And of course, French at this point doesn't take any, any further uh, pressing to, uh, to, to uh, support this idea. His plan calls now, his main plan for 1917 calls for a subsidiary attack at Ypres, but the main attack is going to be down the Belgian coast aimed at the seizure of these German ports. What's going to, and if you look at the plan, it is immensely detailed. I mean, it's a plan about that thick. I mean, it's, a, it's not a contingency plan. Military has contingency plans all the time. This is a plan plan with everything laid out, you know, transportation tables and the whole bit. And in the middle of the offensive, there's going to be a landing by three British divisions along the coast. So this, what they're planning on doing with an amphibious landing is not minor, it's major. Uh, perhaps it'll be a Gallipoli, who knows, because it didn't take place, but the planning is certainly there. The three divisions of troops are going to have to land on the coast again under German fire, then kick back towards the advancing uh, troops from the front lines, and presumably French believes, and Churchill certainly assents, this is going to turn the Germans off the coast. What are they trying to do? A very small BEF would have restored it. Uh, the Russians make a pretty straightforward suggestion to the British that with Turkey, especially attacking in the Caucasus, this is going to endanger the Russian military effort against the Germans. That they're going to have to take increasing troops off the eastern front and throw them down there against the Turks. And the British know full well they could ill afford this, that the, uh, pre taking pressure off the eastern front on Germany would certainly be a bad thing. So Kitchener, Gray, the entire government, the, the cabinet itself approaches Churchill and ask him about that old Dardanelles scheme that they caught wind of a few months back, and the one that was thrown away. Churchill it, um, initially says, no, it can't be done. That, that's what the studies have said to this point. Can't be done. But the First Lord is sent away with instructions to look into it a little bit more deeply. 
And this is where, the, again, the whole Belgian coast thing is going to become unraveled. The extreme nature of the situation has forced Churchill back to looking at a Dardanelles operation. And it begins to look at the Admiralty Studies Group, begins to look at it on January 3rd. And the members of this group, once again, said that a naval attack in and of itself stood a little chance of success. Uh, but Churchill does send a, a very famous telegram to the commander in the Mediterranean, Admiral Sackville Carden, inquiring whether or not the Navy could do this in his professional opinion, since he's the man on the scene. Could the Navy uh, force the Dardanelles all on its own? Carden replies on January 5th that he thinks the Navy can, in fact, force the Straits. And there's the joker in the deck if you're looking at strategic thinking at this point in time. At the War Council meeting of the same day, Churchill reads this telegram from Cardin in support of Kitchener's repeated suggestion. Kitchener has now got the guy who's mainly defected to the Dardanelles. And even though support for that operation was increasing, even, even Churchill retained some doubts. He sent a telegram back to Cardin asking him to develop and put forward a detailed proposal. So now we have a detailed proposal, the attack along the Belgian coast with French assent, a little bit of fright as far as the Dardanelles are concerned, but now it's time to think about real planning for the Dardanelles. So January 1950 is a time of real flux. I mean, the, the British could go lots of different directions, but the one on top is the Belgian coast attack uh, by far, but as we're gonna know, the Dardanelles uh, rises up. Who do we have in the government that's that's going for what? Uh, Kitchener, totally for the Dardanelles. Lloyd George, Balkans. I mean, Lloyd George always picks something else if you follow World War I strategic thought on the part of the British. He always comes up with some idea all of his own. So let, let's go in the Balkans. Uh, Churchill and Fisher, the Navy, they have a number of plans as we discussed before, uh, but they're chiefly stuck on this Belgian coast idea. But events are now pushing the British closer and closer to this Dardanelles idea at the expense of the Belgian coast. French sees all this happening. French sees his Western Front. French is a Westerner. There's the Westerner Eastern debate in World War I. French is a great Westerner. The thing's got to be won on the Western Front. He sees his chance to launch a big, meaningful offensive slipping away. So he's going to launch an offensive in the war cabinet, in the cabinet rather to get his operations approved and all the other ones, especially the Dardanelles, uh, just shot. He asked Joff to support him in this, and Joff, with a sheepish grin on his face, says that he will, and of course he won't. Joff is pretty, pretty happy with the British focusing on the Dardanelles, which will lead him to focus on the French. What French proposes to the war cabinet is the use of 50 battalions of territorial troops He's going to need reinforcements to do anything on the on the coast, and then and here's where it all falls afoul of the uh, of the cabinet. He needs these new troops. He's got to have them, and that's a big cabinet issue. Uh, he also states that concerning artillery, he's got plenty. He, he thinks he's ready to go with these 50 battalions. Um, January 7th, he puts this before the War Council. He gets a quote chilly reception. War Council often gives chilly receptions to sending new troops to the Western Front, even at this early stage. Later in the war, they're going to get even more chilly, chilly about it. Many were advocating sending those troops somewhere else. Again, Lloyd George the Balkans, perhaps husbanding them for something going on in Turkey. Kitchener reported that what France was asking for for his offensive wasn't enough. He, he thinks that the British are going to run to a steamroller on the coast. Again, perhaps that's what they would have done. Uh, but this doesn't mean it, this idea doesn't have a lot of time in the strategic debates going on in Whitehall. He says we don't have this many men and they probably wouldn't have this effect. Ask with agrees. Now French and Churchill are in real trouble. So Churchill really enters the fray. Goes to the war cabinet. Again, I'm getting my terms all mixed up. Again, it goes to the cabinet, the council at this point, stating that the Admiralty puts great and perhaps supreme importance on the Belgian coast. Points out, too, that these 50 battalions, well, they'll be fine because they are going to be augmented by the power of the Royal Navy. And he ends his statement to the War Council by saying it must be recognized that in abandoning this offensive project against Zeebrugge, the communications of the Army, 
and British commerce of the channel will all be jeopardized. So again, we're getting the full court press on the part of the military as they see their plans slipping away. Lloyd George, he says he's against it all. Again, he advocates going even further afield to attack lesser opponents. Churchill attempted to defend against what Lloyd George is bringing up. He pointed out that the attack on the coast is not a simple frontal assault. Again, that's what Lloyd George is always concerned about. Is there going to be a frontal assault against trenches that's going to cost him politically as much as anything else? Churchill says, quote, the army will not be shattered on wire entanglements. This is already coming up in early 1915, this trench deadlock kind of thing. The army will not be shattered on wire entanglements. Instead, there will be the amphibious landing that makes all that wire entanglement problem go away. The War Council now meets on the following day. So it's meeting, this, this is taking up all of its time at the beginning of January. The majority of members still believe that the Western Front was deadlocked and that the cost of breaking these German trenches would be prohibitive. French and Churchill had not won the day, had not convinced the council that this plan that everybody else had approved was the right one to go with. So the War Council begins to look more seriously at other places. Salonika is looked at for a little bit. Salonika will always pop up when the British are desperate. Uh, it's, it's ruled out. Salonika is a little place in Greece, heading up to the Balkans, uh, if you're not familiar with the geography. What everybody comes back to is the Dardanelles. Again, it seems to be an outsized thing that the British can win with very little risk to themselves, perhaps losing just a few ships. At the end of the session, Council decided to drop the Seabrook operation and await further report on possible action from the Dar in, in the Dardanelles. It's important to note that this January 8th topic, 8th, January 8th meeting, Zeebrook arose in another connection. After the council rejected the coastal attack, it inquired of Churchill and Fisher whether the Navy alone, they're back to this idea, can the Navy alone do something about it if you're that hung up on the Belgian coast? And once again, the Navy says, shelling them won't work, blocking them won't work, so the Navy, quote, demurred in any attempt to attack Zeebrugge without the Army helping it along the Belgian coast. The Navy's rejection of bombardment was on the record. The Navy's rejection of blocking the ports was on the record. So again, the only thing we have are these attacks that are now in disfavor, uh, set up against what's going on potentially in the Dardanelles. So Churchill writes to France. Churchill is unwilling to let this whole thing go away. He admitted that Kitchener was fair in his treatment, that Kitchener wasn't too far off base here, but he doesn't think that the plan is unsalvageable. He thinks we can go ahead and still have a shot at it. Um, French didn't take the rejection well, as you might suspect, what had just happened in the war cap, that he agrees with Churchill that perhaps they still have one final shot at it. He believes the true situation, again, a true Westerner speaking here, quote, that the situation in France and Flanders was incorrectly and wrongly appreciated. He has a very clear understanding that the offensive in World War I is still pretty possible, especially along this coast. He, with Prime Minister Asquith's support, decided that one more shot at the War Council uh, was necessary. So Asquith is still kind of on the fence wondering about this. Churchill is the first at this next meeting of the War Council to have his input. He tells French before that meeting, quote, it's not until all northern possibilities, i.e. Belgium, are exhausted that I'll look south to the Dardanelles as a field of profitable employment for our expanding military forces. But we should plan for every contingency. As it turns out, Churchill is ready to jump ship on this attack as well. Regardless of Churchill's claims, Fr uh, 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 French, um, with an uh, impeccable sense of timing, uh, received a, a telegram from Cardin that's going to change everything. Remember, Cardin had been sent aside to come up with his detailed plan, and that telegram came in on the 12th of January. And the Admiralty looks it over and believes that Cardin's proposals for a naval assault through the Dardanelles on its own, without any land-based forces at Gallipoli, would work. 
Churchill now abandons the Belgium scheme totally. Because here's a Navy going to win a big battle in World War I on its own. Uh, perhaps the Navy working in tandem with the Army would be nice, uh, but the Navy winning the victory on its own is even nicer. So now Churchill flees, and the only man standing left in, the favor, in favor of Belgium is French when we get to the War Council meeting of, of January 13th. Members of the Council on that day questioned French about the losses he expected to suffer. I mean, there's the trump card coming out, right? You know, we, we don't like your attack. Ooh, the Navy's going to do this for free down there in Turkey. What numbers are you going to lose? Kitchener reports that the British are going to lose at least 10,000 men in this attack. Again, pretty low in World War I terms because the, the true nature of this war hadn't really dawned on them yet. French says no, that number's closer to 3,000 men we're going to lose. Of course, this is, this is the chief argument. Can Britain really stand to lose this many men when it's already down to populating its forces on the Western Front with territorials, troops from India? You name it. Churchill is brought in as well. And he's asked specifically once again, now you've been harping on this for months now, Winston. What do you think about this Belgian coast? Tell us for true. He says that the Royal Navy's put at a serious disadvantage by German ownership of the Belgian coast. But then he says, the Admiralty, however, could not regard the matter as one of absolutely vital importance from a naval point of view. This is not what he's been saying to this point. Not at all. He's been saying the exact opposite to this point. Why has he defected? He's defected because this attack down in the Dardanelles is going to give him better political jollies, right? It's going to make sure the Navy wins this war and the Army has less to do with it. It's inter-service rivalry. It's political rivalry. <clears throat> He goes on to say the quote, the German possession of the Belgian coast will not kill our naval supremacy. So now it's essentially, it's essentially all over. The First Lord had lost his support for the Flanders operation. The only person still standing in favor of it was French. Churchill now switched all of his considerable rhetorical power to the support of the Dardanelles. And the War Council had, uh, had in its minutes says that it, quote, turned eagerly from the dreary vista of a slogging match on the Western Front to higher prospects in the Mediterranean. It's going to be a lot easier down there, according to the wonderful folks of the British War Council. Of course, as it turns out, it's going to lead to the failure, uh, failure uh, slogging match of Gallipoli. Churchill eventually writes to French and you know, kind of gives him a pat on the back. Sorry, your big plan didn't work out. Your big plan didn't work out. French writes back to Churchill. I have some quotes here, but I'm running out of time. French writes back to Churchill saying, it's not my big plan that didn't work out. It was your big plan that didn't work out. You're the one that's been foisting this on me from the beginning. You're the one that's been causing us all this problem, and then you jump ship. I mean, there's this huge, not huge, it's four or five letters between them, just trading verbal barbs back and forth. French feels betrayed, and arguably he is, he is betrayed. So what happens, of course, we move off to the Dardanelles, but that is not to say that what happens in 1915 and late 1914 was simply Dardanelles based. I mean, Belgium was the award winner for most of this time. Belgium was the odds on favorite to have a British you know, meaningful offensive there in 19, late 1914, even a winter offensive, but certainly a spring 1915 offensive. Uh, didn't work out that way. The Dardanelles is what's coming along. As it turned out, the War Council's decision to reject the coastal offensive effectively only delayed the inevitable, however. The problem of German possession of the eastern entrance to the channel was to remain, and Ostend and Zeebrug, especially those two places, retained a dominant place in British strategic thinking. They lurked behind the scenes for the remainder of 1915. If you dig into their planning, they're still looking at this stuff in 1915. They cast a spell over Haig in 1916, made sure they lost their attack at the Somme, but his plan is for an attack in Flanders, period. And it always will be, partly because the Navy demands it. And of course, all this is pivotal to 1917. 
Now, this is the centerpiece of what Haig is doing in 1917. And of course, there's even the Ostend and Seabrook uh, raids of 1918, in which the ports are effectively blocked, at least for a little while. So this thing retains a uh, dominance over British strategic imagination for the remainder of, remainder of the war. In a post-war letter uh, to Churchill, in reference to the War Council's rejection of the planning in 1915, uh, French called it, quote, one of the greatest tragedies of the war. French refuses to believe that you know going over the Dardanelles and, and not attacking in Belgium was a good idea. He, he remains hung up on this even in his memoirs, if you read him after the war. Um, his statement, of course, is made with the full knowledge that whole lots of men lost their lives in 1917 and 1918 to do what he was going to try to do in 1915, these efforts to neutralize the German ports. While this last guy is no doubt a biased source, it seems fair to me because it's such a good quote to let Sir John Fisher have the last word in the matter. In May 1917, the Brit British were ready for operations in Flanders. And he wrote in his diary, quote, Had the Admiralty proposal in 1914 been carried out, and it was approved and smashed by the Dardanelles adventure, of a British army advancing along the seashore flanked by the British fleet, there would have been no submarine menace and we could have recaptured Antwerp. Sir John French was had over three times to the War Council and concurred to carry it out, asking for only two divisions of men. But again, I was foiled, personalizing everything. I was foiled, Sir John Fisher. And it will have to be done now. Thanks. We've got some time for questions. I almost finished on time. Yes, sir. How did Churchill ever recover his credibility? Uh, with French, he did, and of course, he's going to lose all credibility about midway through the about midway through the next year, uh, when the uh, when the Dardanelles works out not well at all. You know, Ch Churchill once again goes to the wilderness. In fact, in this case goes to the wilderness of the Western Front. Um, with a lot of folks, he's never going to regain his credibility. Of course, I mean, there's that great thing about Churchill, that he is one of the greatest failures in British political history until 1939, right? So, and, and the Dardanelles is probably, I mean, other than the fact he's flip-flop parties a couple times, the Dardanelles is key. He's the key thing. His political career may have been wholly different had something crappy happened in Belgium as opposed to something crappy happening in the Dardanelles, right? At least he has top cover. At least he has top cover in Belgium. I mean, that's the key thing here is would this attack have done anything? And, you know, it's, it's counterfactual to even think it, but, you know, who knows? Yes, sir. Uh, the U boat menace became, uh, made uh, Zeebrugge and uh, uh, Ostend much more important. Maybe they, it didn't seem so important early in 1914, the possession of those two ports? Uh, to to the Germans, actually, it doesn't seem important at all. I mean, the Germans are very much, you know, land-based thinking, as they often are. But again, in, in a letter I didn't quote here, Churchill says, even a land-based power like Germany cannot remain blind to the benefit of these ports for very long. Um, I think as much as anything else, there's, there's still that idea of that this war isn't going to last long enough for British naval mastery to be uh, to be undercut, and I don't think too that they've. I mean, if you look in, the, in my research, I looked a lot at um, Angelico during all this as well, uh, commander of the Grand Fleet who didn't come up uh, during this part. They're def definitely frightened of U-boats. They're definitely frightened of what they can do, but they have no concept of U-boats as anti-merchant shipping yet. They think U-boats are going to be used in conjunction with a with a fleet battle. So they're really worried about Austin and Zebra, but for fleet versus fleet battles at this point as much as anything else. Uh, the, what the U-boats can do to strangle Britain, that that really is going to come as a surprise to the Admiralty as this war unfolds. Uh, so do they have a healthy vision of what the, the Belgian coast means? Yeah, without doubt. But do they understand what it's really going to mean? Probably not. And they'd have to project their minds into the future in a different way. Yes, sir? You say that uh, they didn't have much 
use or predicted use for the U-boats, and they were primarily land-based. But didn't Germany at this time have some of the uh, latest technology for submarines? Oh yeah, I mean the Germans do have wonderful submarine technology. Well, wonderful in World War One standards. But again, most thinking at this point in time is not uh, German thinking. It is not to use the U-boats as a standalone throw a cordon around Britain and sink the merchant shipping kind of thing. Most, <coughs> most German thinking is surface at this point in time. Most German thinking is still running along the high seas fleet, catching, they can't catch the whole Grand Fleet because that would be a bad day, uh, catching at least exposed parts of the Grand Fleet. And that's what Jellicoe is always worried about. If you look at what happens at Jutland, for instance, one of the reasons he doesn't press some of his advantages is he's always thinking there may be a line of German U-boats waiting for me, and this may be a trap. You know, the Germans are running away, I'm going to run across a shoal of their U-boats, against which the capital ships have really no defense. I mean, the German, the U-boats have no defense either, but they'd much rather lose a U-boat and you know, British lose a dreadnought, they'd take that any day. So at this early point in the war, yeah, Germans are ahead in U-boat technology, but it's mainly a way for their surface fleet, which is smaller, to play a bigger role in a surface battle. It's going to be really in 1915 that they begin to see what U-boats can do to, to uh, uh, merchant shipping. And by the way, you know, Austin and Zeebrugge are never really used for that many U-boats. Uh, most of the German U-boats come from the main, main fleet bases back in Germany. Yes, sir? The, um the minutes or the notices or what was recorded from the war councils, did this come from many, many sources and when was that re released to the public? Long after the war? Um, generally speaking, these records are sat on by the Brits for about 70 years. That's a usual uh, kind of thing. So that's one of the reasons you see such a flowering of uh, uh, World War One historiography about the British about 70 years after the war, the war ends. Um, there are ways to get at it, um, especially, I mean, all these guys wrote their memoirs after the war, Lloyd George, Hankey, you know, all these guys you know, write something about World War One, and that's certainly one way to access what this War Council's doing. But this War Council kept phenomenal minutes, I mean, word by word, by word minutes, and if you go to the uh, uh, archives in Britain, again, they're, they're there, they're probably online now, because these are... The cabinet documents from World War I are probably some of the most used documents as far as history documents are concerned in Britain, so they may well be digitized now. Um, are they ever open to the public? Yeah, they're open. The public doesn't tend to go into archives and see them now. So yeah, these are very open, uh, very easy to access. The public record office or the British National Archives is now called as a great place to go to research. Um, and I'm not sure what the close, what the opening date was, but it's generally 50 to 70 years. And the British are extremely good at, I mean, they, they write down, like Colonel Maurice Hankey, if you ever want to know what the British are thinking, he's the War Cabinet Secretary, and he writes down every word. He is an encyclopedic. He's the source. Well, thank you, Doctor. Thank you, good question. Thank you.